Welcome. I'm Jim Falk, and today we're talking about a political hot potato, critical questions about the growing number of documents that protect our nation's secrets. The discovery of classified documents found in President Biden's former office from when he was vice president, as well as the classified documents found at President Trump's Mar-a-Lago estate. All of this raised serious concerns about our nation's security. It appears that classification is not always done to ensure our national security, but to potentially shield our government and those who act on our behalf from embarrassment, policy failures, and frankly, just plain incompetence. So why should we, as citizens, care? Let's meet our two experts on the growing maze of government secrets. Guiding us through the growing maze of government secrets is Columbia University Professor Matthew Conley. In addition to teaching international and global history, he co-directs the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy and is a principal investigator of History Lab. He's the author of The Declassification Engine, What History Reveals About America's Top Secrets. Also joining us on today's program is Richard Immerman. He's Emeritus Professor of History at Temple University, and he's the former Assistant Deputy Director of National Intelligence. We're gonna be learning a lot more about that. And for a decade, he chaired the Historical Advisory Committee to the Department of State. Gentlemen, thank you both for being with us. Thank you, Jim. My pleasure. So give us a sense about just how many people yeah, I mentioned top secret, but how many people have access to classified information? It's about 5 million people. Uh, so that means, you know, literally millions of people are cleared to have national security information. Uh, just to put that in perspective, even if you only took the people who have top secret security clearance, that's more people who live in the District of Columbia. So it's really quite a large number of people. And Richard, just give us a sense as well as how much information is there out there? I mean, I, I gather that it could, could, we could probably go to the moon and back a few times. More than a few times, many times. There is a, a really incalculable amount of information out there, which is also being produced and replicated literally every minute uh, of the day and it's being gathered. Uh, so there, there's really no way to estimate the, the, the total volume of information at this point because it's a moving target. We could probably spend an entire program just talking about our nation's, our, our philosophy regarding secrecy. But Matthew, in the book, I believe it's in the first chapter or two, you really do uh, describe how our founding fathers had a, perhaps a very different view about secrecy than, than we might surmise. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you read the Constitution, there's nothing in it that authorizes the president you know, to keep secrets from the American people. Uh, you know, this is something that's really a modern phenomenon. It's really only since the uh, Second World War that we have, you know, what I would call, you know, the, the dark state of an immense you know, national security establishment with some 18 different intelligence agencies. You know, with the Pentagon, with the budget approaching, you know, $800 billion. So you might think, you know, many people would think that, you know, secrecy is really just something that governments do. But that hasn't been the American tradition. For the first 150 years, the United States was actually remarkably transparent. And so this is really just a departure, and it's something that only dates back to about 80 years ago. And did that have something to do with really nuclear uh, weapons? Was that a catalyst? That's the part of it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was certainly a justification uh, because what happened until the Second World War is that, you know, with each war, the United States would mobilize, you know, they would, you know, begin to uh, recruit agents. They would uh, start to centralize, you know, intelligence reports and so on. But as soon as the war was over, you know, whether we're talking about the Civil War or the First World War, you know, this was dismantled, right? Because the American people just wouldn't put up with a, a permanent, you know, establishment like this with all of its costs and all of its risks. But after the Second World War, you know, the, the argument was made you know, by the Truman administration that we were living in a new era, right? Uh, which the country faced existential risks from things like uh, nuclear weapons and faced an enemy, an implacable enemy of the Soviet Union. 
and it justified, even demanded, you know, creating uh, these these departments and agencies. What until then had been extraordinary measures, and beginning to treat them as if you know it was the new normal. Richard, what are the basic parameters that one considers if you're in government about? when something should be classified. We always hear about sources and methods, for example. Well, you, you, you've mentioned it. I mean, that, that the buzzwords are sources and methods. Uh, essentially, uh, there, there, are, there are two primary categories. One has to do with security. What would endanger the national security of the United States? Um, and the second, which is much more limited in, in the context we're talking, it has to do with privacy and personal information. Um, but it is primarily security and the concern that uh, a, a memo, um, even that if it seems incredibly adnine to any of us, will somehow reveal a source or a method uh, which would not just endanger or, or jeopardize our capability to use that sources and methods in the future, but it would also perhaps put at risk, particularly who that source might be, whether it be a human asset or someone over overseas. So the result being that um, we overclassify a lot of information uh, because the default position is when in doubt, let's keep it class classified because that risk is something that we're not willing to accept. Well, let me ask you this. If, if I were a diplomat right now, say, in, in Tunis, Tunisia, and I wrote a cable and classified it one level and it went to the CIA or Department of Energy, could they classify it differently? Well, first of all, many, many memos that are produced now have what we call equities. In other words, different, uh, different agencies have a vested interest in that. So if this went to the, the agency, the agency would also have an equity. So they would each be able to have uh, a voice in whether it's not, it, it's declassified. And in addition to that, each one has different standards. They're actually trying to regularize that standard. But in what you were saying, the issue would be moot because if it's classified, it would not be declassified for years, if not decades after, under any circumstances. So it's not as if those agencies and those individuals would be meeting around the table now and decide whether or not to declassify it. That's something that's going to happen in, in the future. Um, and those people in all likelihood will not be involved. All right, well, let's talk about declassification. Uh, and that's certainly, Matt, what your book is about. When is a document declassified and who makes that ultimate decision? I suspect well, it's not good. always the president of the United States, but we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> well, it could be uh, because, you know, it's true that a president does have sovereign control over what is secret. You know, it's one of the powers that presidents have. I think it's really the only power that is completely unchecked uh, because courts have decided over and over again that they won't even look at records that government officials, government lawyers tell them is national security information before denying people their you know, Freedom of Information Act requests. And similarly, you know, Congress over and over again has declined you know, to pass legislation that would regulate uh, you know, beyond the Freedom of Information Act itself, would regulate in some way the way that government officials classify information. So really this is one way in which the president is king. Now that said, you know, presidents, have to set rules, right? And you know, every president, going back to Franklin Roosevelt, has issued an executive order that is supposed to regulate what information is protected and for how long. And over and over again, presidents have, for example, stipulated that after a set number of years, you know, sometimes it's 25 years, sometimes it's longer, every document is supposed to be automatically declassified. But the problem is that they also, at the same time, make so many exceptions you know, that any self-respecting bureaucrat can find some reason not to declassify something. And some departments and agencies, you know, will routinely withhold 90% or more of the records that they're supposed to automatically declassify. Now, there's one exception. There's one president who never issued an executive order about secrecy, who pronounced himself, in effect, perfectly happy with the secrecy rules that have been passed by the previous administration. And that president is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is the only president who really issued no executive order, any guidance of any kind. 
And so that to me is like one of the you know interesting exceptions in this you know really fascinating history. Matt, tell us about the history that your your, your history lab. Yeah, so this is a, a group of data scientists and social scientists who got together about eight years ago and realized you know, that there are now millions of documents that have been declassified. Of course, you know, there are infinite numbers of documents that we don't know about, but the ones that have been released are now, you know, quite sizable in number. And if you can, as we have, aggregate you know, these millions of declassified documents and start using data science tools, you know, using artificial intelligence, you can begin to discover patterns and anomalies in the kinds of things the government didn't want us to know. So you, in, in your book, you give a, f a few great anecdotes and examples. Briefly tell our viewers about Pearl Harbor and what you learned. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, so this is a document that for a long time was kept locked up at the Eisenhower Library. You know, it dates to 1954. It was a, a year in which you know, Winston Churchill, uh, already quite aged at that point, made an official visit to the White House. And as he often liked to do, you know, he had quite a lot to drink you know, over dinner. And after the dinner, he was uh, talking with you know, some of his uh, you know, friends. And some of them, you know, like Eisenhower himself, also war veterans. And it was then that he started telling this story about Pearl Harbor. And he talked about how it is that yeah, there was a cable uh, that was, uh, you know, one that has now become famous, you know, where you could tell that the Japanese diplomats in Washington were breaking off negotiations. And everybody knew at that time that that meant the beginning of war. But for some reason, that cable was held up and it was never delivered. So Churchill asked Fidel Smith, who had been uh, the man on the spot back in 1941, called him over from across the room and asked him, you know, so general, what happened to that cable that you never delivered? What happened to that cable? And so this was just one of a number of things that, that Churchill started to say about what happened at Pearl Harbor in ways that you can't help but think, you know, that Churchill himself, you know, had doubts, you know, about the official story. Now this whole story, that whole passage from that top secret document was redacted. And it was redacted for many decades, even when the rest of it was released, even when information about, you know, numbers of British thermonuclear weapons you know, information that was quite sensitive at the time about, for example, the U.S. plan to overthrow the government in Guatemala, all of that was released. But this war story, you know, that was already 10 years old or more when Churchill told it, that was kept secret all the way up until 1993. In, in, in your book, you, you obviously are focusing on declassified documents. Did you come across anything that was declassified that you looked at and went, oh my goodness, this should not have been declassified? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, there is uh, information, you know, about how to create explosives with garden variety materials. You know, there are manuals, mm -hmm. you know, for uh, snipers, you know, how to take people out from a distance. Um, you can find in government records, you can find people's social security numbers, dates of birth, you know, the personal information of, of servicemen that could be used for identity theft. There's so how does that happen? It, it, this is a failure of the system? Absolutely. I mean, just think of it. Uh, the government, at last time they came up with an estimate for how much they spent to protect national security information, it was over $18 billion, right? Mm -hmm. Over $18 billion. That's more than the budget, for example, the Department of the Treasury, right? So this would be one of our larger federal departments if all this money you know, was vested in a ministry of secrecy, say. Um, how much of that money, you might ask, is devoted to what I'm talking about, like reviewing records and deciding what could be released, and then withholding those records that might still have either national security or personal information? It's about $100 million. So it's about half of 1% of the money the government spends on secrecy goes to deciding what it is that we, the people, are allowed to know. So there are presidents, one after another, who will say, you know, we have to strike a balance. We have to strike a balance between national security on the one hand you know, and on the other hand, the people's right to know. But I'm here to tell you, there is no balance. The whole system is completely out of control. And both of you are esteemed scholars. How difficult it is to get information from the Freedom of Information Act? It's, it's very difficult. Um, it's also very expensive. Uh, and um, let me stop you I there. Mean, why, why, why is it expensive? Well, I mean, when, when you file a, a, a Freedom of Information Act request, um, it costs money to do a search for the documents. And then uh, when you get the documents, 
I, I had, as, as Matt knows very well, I worked for a long time on what was known as the solarium reports. And I kept getting them declassified. They were they're very long. And each time they would declassify it, it would be one more line and they would pay me, they would charge me to send me the entire report again. So it, it, it's very expensive. But then also, if you have to file appeal, you often have to bring in lawyers. Um, it, it, so it's time. It's also expense. It's a very cumbersome process, which, in fact, the National Archives recognized a number of years ago by setting up a committee. An ad, an ad hoc committee, theoretically, to reform it, but it has not made any progress um, at all. So without in any way um, saying that we should do away with the Freedom of Information Act, I don't know anyone who would say that this works effectively in, in any way. And I um, mean, we maybe we'll get this into this later, that now with all the electronic records and the lack of a finding guide and all of that, all these issues have become exponentially more challenging, um, if not impossible or intractable in any event. So you, know, you left uh, academia for a brief period of time, and I mentioned an abbreviated title. Let me read the whole title that you had with the uh, uh, National Intelligence. Assistant Deputy Director of National Intelligence for Analytic Integrity and Standards. Well, oh, you must have had a long, big card. What was that, and why is it important? So uh, after 9-11, and then even more so after the, uh, uh, let's just say the, um, the poor quality of the national intelligence estimate on Iraq's uh, uh, nuclear weapons program, or lack thereof, uh, Congress passed um, legislation to reform the intelligence community, well, both to um, foster more interaction, collaboration among the agencies, but also to improve the quality of the intelligence estimates themselves, which would include um, making more transparent the, re the, the sources that it is that intelligence was based on, um, and also uh, assessing the reliability of those sources. So my my position was one of the very few that was explicitly specified in that reform legislation to create what was known as an entity that would um, both work with the intelligence community, all the different elements to improve the quality of the intelligence estimates um, and to evaluate how effectively uh, the analyst conformed to what I developed as standards, my office developed as standards. So that's what my mission was. I did not um, produce the intelligence. I just uh, monitored, evaluated it, and, and developed different ways to improve the quality of it. Well, I suspect in government, you know, there is a desire, as I mentioned earlier, to cover up certain issues and sometimes incompetence. Uh, how do we get I mean, does that happen a lot? Uh, Matt, I know in your, in your book you talked about instances where the military in particular are quite adept at uh, sweeping things under the rug. To give an example, you know, every federal department is required by law to produce uh, you know, a, accounting, right, of how it is that they spend taxpayer money. Um, this has been a legal requirement for many years. And for many years, the Pentagon uh, has been unable to comply. In fact, they refused. Until finally, a couple of years ago, they undertook this kind of audit and they hired an external you know, accounting firm to carry it out. And the accounting firm basically gave up and said there were so many billions of dollars that couldn't be accounted for that it was effectively impossible to tell how the Pentagon was spending our money. So I mean, there are many stories like this. This is just one of the examples that has a lot of zeros at the end of it, but there are countless others. So a lot has changed as far as how presidents maintain records. And if you could briefly, Richard, tell us about how the presidential library for President Nixon was handled one way and that was changed. And where are we now all the way to uh, the records maintained by President Trump or, or, or even Joe Biden now? Or, or, or the lack thereof. Um, you know, let me just mention, um, and I'll, I'll be very, very brief, uh, that uh, until um, there were no presidential uh, 
libraries until the relatively recent future. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt's was the first library that came under the national, that, that NARA, the, what is now known as NARA. Uh, the Herbert Hoover Library was before. So this is a relatively new regime. And with uh, particularly uh, the, the, the controversy over Richard Nixon's papers and his records and all of it, Congress enacted what's known as the Presidential Records Act, which by and large regularized or required the retention of these of, of records and they, they, how they're categorized in different ways that 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 has evolved over time. But it really wasn't until the Carter administration that a regime was placed place that, that maintained that they, or ensured that presidential records would be kept. Um, and now it's become that much more difficult because un, under ironically, to some extent, under President Obama, the presidential record, um, the presidential library system is undercoming a, a complete overhaul in which the library itself is essentially becomes a museum. The records will be kept electronically, electronically in Washington, which means that Matt and I are not going to be able to do to conduct research as we used to in the presidential libraries. Um, mm -hmm. But theoretically, they will be maintained. There is no enforcement mechanism for the Presidential Records Act, which is one of the problems. And one hopes that Congress does uh, enact something that, that requires something more than someone from NARA going over to the White House and begging to get the papers. But that essentially is, is, is what we're left with at this point. How does it change the work of a, a scholar, someone working on their, on their doctorate right now? You know, if you are advising grad students, as we do, and you're trying to help them pick topics where they're going to find sources, it's helpful to look at, you know, how many records have been released. And if you look at a graph, you know, if you see it laid out, you know, starting with records from the 1940s all the way up to, say, you know, the 1990s, what you see is like a slope of a hill. Right. So if, if you're interested in, in studying the history of the Second World War, the Eisenhower administration, the early Cold War, you know, there's an enormous amount of material you can work with, all kinds of things. You know, CIA national intelligence estimates, you know, transcripts of meetings the National Security Council and so on. By the time, you know, you get to the 1990s, there's almost nothing. I mean, it's just dwindled. You know, the CIA has released almost no records in recent years. They've largely shut down their declassification program. You know, the uh, Foreign Relations United States, which is the official record of American foreign policy that by law is produced by the State Department every year, that's come shuddering, you know, to, to you know, not quite uh, an end, but there are far fewer records are being released now than were being, being released just 10 years ago. And so, you know, the interesting thing is we, we think we live in this age of abundance, right? There's more information all the time, but that's not true when it comes to keeping our own government accountable. Um, you know, our own government is, is releasing far less information than it did 20 years ago. Only a quarter as many documents are getting declassified annually compared to 20 years ago. And, right? and is that a question of, again, resources and money, or is it by design? It's, it's largely a question of resources, but sure. I mean, it's also by design, because <clears throat> if you work with government, well, why would you want annoying people like Richard and I, you know, pouring through these files and figuring out, you know, who did what? Right? Lots of people would love to do what they like without ever ha being held to account, especially when they hold a lot of power. Right? So I don't think it's a mistake you know, that uh, so little money is put into you know, preserving records and releasing them to the public. Um, I think that this is something that works quite well, whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican, you, know, you really don't see a lot of people working hard to try to release records for the public. And both of you co-wrote a op-ed piece for the New York Times in 2015 about Hillary Clinton's emails. So yeah, that's right. I mean, this is not a partisan issue for me. Um, you know, Richard and I, uh, I, I think it was outrageous. You know, I'll just speak for myself for the moment. But personally, I think it's it's outrageous that you know, the Secretary of State decided there are tens of thousands of her email that nobody ever had to look at because she and her lawyers decided they were personal and deleted every last one of them. I mean, that's outrageous. It's also outrageous that we had a sitting president who would literally tear up his papers into tiny little pieces. And then the people who scotch taped them back together, those people were fired. 
So this is something I think goes beyond, you know, Republicans, Democrats, red, blue. I think this is something that all Americans have to wake up and become aware of. No, I was just going to say that the only thing that's going to change this is if American citizens rouse themselves and begin mobilizing to try to reverse these trends. One of the things we have just another minute left, and I want to be sure we talk about contractors and how and, 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 and if you can just briefly talk about that, Richard, because it is such a, a key point. Government is, is now somewhat of a shell game so that, for example, in my office, when I was at the, the in, in, in ODNI, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, there were about 15 of us, to, I think less than that, who were what was known as cadre, and there were about 35 who were contractors. Um, and that's the way that we, we can sort of play games about avoiding a, a, uh, a bloated bureaucracy. But the point is, is that the contractors do a lot of the same work that government officials do. Um, they have the security clearances. Many of them, in fact, were former government officials who then went across the street at Tyson's Corner or, or, or something. And the, basically, contractors make the world, the world go round now, or at least what made our government. Our government could not um, exist or could not function without contractors. And they, again, it's a balance. It's a staggering the number of contractors compared to a quote unquote official government employees. So bottom line in 15 seconds, Matt, what does what our viewers need to think about this and what should they do? Well, you may think and many people will say that, you know, one day historians will judge, right? We'll have a perspective and we'll have all the records. But as an historian, I'm here to tell you that we can't do our jobs, you know, unless citizens do their jobs in demanding that we hold our government accountable, because unless they preserve these records, the court of history is closed. That's a good period. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen, for being on our program. And to all of you, thank you so much for watching. We're here talking about things that matter with people who care.